All right. So the retina, and I say the same thing to, to patients, your ophthalmologist or somebody looking in your eyeballs is going to diagnose your type 2 diabetes probably before someone else does. Go see a cardiologist, your, right. Because they're seeing these retinal changes. And when folks hear me say this, I'm sure people who've listened to me for a while have heard me say this a million times. I always say type 2 diabetes is really the end result of a disaster that's been going on for a decade or two. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is if those retinal changes are happening and they're visible, they're happening in the kidneys. They're mm -hmm. happening everywhere else. There's a fine vascular bed where these really important interactions are happening at these end organs. And mm -hmm. so that's what I exactly what I mean when I say you're looking at a life of dialysis at the end of this trail because you're blowing your blindness and dialysis if you get that far, if the cardiovascular right. disease doesn't take you out first. And then if you keep going, you're going to end up with dementia because guess where another huge vascular bed is? But yeah, the brain. So this is, I'm just trying to lay the physiologic groundwork for people to understand this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so before we jump into the study, I've been getting asked inside of my program, my Ozempic Dunright University, some of my students in there have asked, well, hey, I'm finding because uh, I provide them with like a 27 and growing page document where all I, every study I find, I throw in there for them, for the students in my program. And one lady was going through looking at the eye studies and she said, it looks like GLP ones are worsening diabetic retinopathy. And I was like, yes. And here's my hypothesis. And I'll have you add on to the, what you were, because we, you were going there when I interrupted you. If you are bathing a tissue in high levels of blood glucose, it becomes accustomed cellularly and receptor wise to those high levels of blood sugar. And when you, if you've got someone who's a long standing diabetic, is it safe to say they probably got pretty severe retinal damage, right? Mm -hmm. And probably pretty severe cardiovascular damage. Certainly. Okay. So you, put them into a state where even if it's not hypoglycemia, you just significantly reduce mm -hmm. that blood sugar load quickly with the GLP ones because they don't actually induce as much of a hypoglycemia, say like metformin, but they will definitely pull it down into normal levels and maybe below normal, maybe a little bit more with terzepatide. So now those tissues are quite literally starving for a hot second. Mm -hmm. So they're going to respond by doing some pretty funky things. And nervous tissue is quite sensitive and that microvasculature is too. So I'll let you take it from there because that's where you were going when I cut you off. Yes. So it's that relative hypoglycemia, right? So even if it's not textbook, you know, under 60, 65 level of blood sugar, it could be your normal was your fasting blood sugar around 160, 170 or higher. And then suddenly you're having your fasting blood sugar 80 or 70, mm -hmm. you know, something that is a target but ultimately it's low for them. So that is meaning that we're basically starving those cells from what they're used to. You know, if we take you and you're used to eating a 2000 calorie a day diet and suddenly we're giving you 500 calories, you're gonna, you're gonna feel it. My tissues so are gonna freak out for a second. Exactly, so and, we get and, this oh, sorry, narrowing. Oh no, I was just gonna say, so we do get this narrowing because they're not being flooded um, with that level of sugar and insulin like they're used to. Well, sometimes these folks have blood sugars of like 300 and something. Yes. And they're swimming in insulin, which is pro-grow. Insulin is mm -hmm. an anabolic hormone, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's a pepti signaling peptide hormone. So they're swimming in this soup of, of ugh, it's a mess. <laughs> I don't have a better word, but it's just a disaster. And people are walking around like this every day, not realizing what's going on. And all of that insulin is causing this fibrosis as well. So now... Explain in detail what's happening when you say there's vascular spasm. What is that and why? Well, so it starts with the patient being hyperinsulinemic. So they've got massive amounts of insulin swimming around in their bloodstream all the time. That alone constricts the blood vessel because it inhibits, it cuts off the ability for the blood vessel to produce nitric oxide, which again allows the blood vessel to expand and dilate, flooding the tissue, flooding the nerve, flooding the retina with blood. Now, when we cut that, which is again, an already compromised vascular system. So we have this blood vessel that's not able to relax and expand, and then we starve it. So it's just kind of freaking out. So it's going to go into this constrictive mode and it's going to starve the end tissue. Yes. And this is what I was telling the folks inside my program 
on my thoughts and hypothesis around this wor potential worsening of diabetic retinopathy, there's little data on it, but what is out there, and this isn't the study I'm, that just came up. This is just general diabetic retinopathy. Uh, what little data there is, these folks were extremely brittle diabetics. They were long standing, So there was a lot of damage done is what I'm trying to get at. There was already a lot of damage done for several decades. And then they were probably put on rock and high levels of GLP-1s and brought up too high, too fast. So the tissues really didn't have time to cal recalibrate and to mm -hmm. become accustomed to this new insulin blood glucose level that's happening inside the body on these high levels of GLP-1. So it takes me back to my theory that a lot of this is a dosing and management issue.